So my job is systems euthanizer. And, uh, and euthanizer is a person that goes to living beings that are sick and kills them out of pity. Uh, I've been doing this for my entire career, from system to system, going to various companies, finding these sick, ailing systems, and uh, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, but hopefully humanely putting them out of their misery and putting them out of the misery of the people that uh, are having to maintain them. And I hate this job. I hate it. Uh, I wrote this book called The Passionate Programmer, which is about being passionate about your career, but I really hate my career. It's terrible. I spend all of my time destroying the hard work of other people, sometimes of myself. It's really kind of depressing. So I hope to someday stop doing that. And my talk is not really about microservices or all those buzzwords that you saw on the title slide. My talk is about attempting over my career to learn to build systems that can survive and perhaps outlive me. So that's what I'm gonna talk about, I hope. And I'm gonna do it uh, via a real world story. So I currently work for a company that builds an application called Wunderlist. Uh, I live in Germany and uh, the company is called Zex Wunderkinder. Um, it's a to-do list application. So uh, when I went out there and I started working on this thing, my friends all kind of thought, this is sort of silly. You're building a to-do list application. Isn't that the hello world of internet applications? So you've probably all built a to-do list or at least worked really quickly through a tutorial where someone showed you how to build a to-do list in some sort of technology. Um, I have a more interesting way to talk about what Wonderlist is. It happens to be a to-do list, but it's a to-do list sitting on top of a cross-platform, multi-user, multi-master, real-time replicated mobile database system. So if microservice wasn't buzzwordy enough for you, then the description of Wonderlist should be buzzwordy enough for you. But it really is that to some extent. That's a, that's a glorification, of course, but it's a pretty hard problem. We have millions of active users, we're a very popular application. We're on, we have native clients on pretty much any platform that you would care to run something like this on, uh, and it's very popular. We have a synchronization system that is sort of domain agnostic, but we happen to be running project management and to do kind of stuff on it. So this is what we build. Now, uh, about two and a half years ago, I talked to the team the first time. They brought me out to Berlin, and they were very proudly showing me the new version of Wonderlist that they were working on, Wonderlist 2. So they had built Wonderlist 1, which was built by the founders, uh, very much the kind of early uh, prototype sort of thing. Um, surprisingly, people loved this. It was actually built in titanium, if you know this, Accelerator titanium. So it was one of those cross-platform things where you build an HTML and you compile to iOS and Android and et cetera, et cetera. And to their surprise, it became very, very popular. And part of it is because they really did a great job of designing and they did a great job of marketing. Uh, then they built this grander vision of this thing called WonderKit, which was this huge project management application that completely failed, almost destroyed the company and they threw it away. So when I met them, they were just about done with their beautiful rewrite of Wonderless 2 that they were unveiling to the world. Um, and they did a great job of marketing again. So on December 18th, 2012, I had already signed the contract to join the company, and they excitedly posted their blog post, and they had lined up press, they had global features in all the app stores, they're amazing at doing this stuff. Uh, they, anyone who worked at the company at the time will never forget December 18th as a date because it was probably the worst day of any of their careers. Um, it was almost the worst day of mine, and I didn't even work there yet. So this is what December 18th looked like. Any of you use New Relic by chance? So for those that don't, this is not good. Uh, you can probably tell, like red is sort of universally maligned as a color that you don't want to see on a graph. Um, I actually, from the first keynote, got a more simplified view of this picture, and it looked like this. So this is basically exactly what happened. The database was on fire. Uh, it was a huge mess. And what they had created, and this was before I got there, so it's not my fault. Um, actually, I told them it looked good, so it, it sort of is my fault. But they had created one big monolithic application sitting on top of a monolithic database, which is actually quite a large database. 
given how many active users were using the product already um, and how much data that they were creating in the product. And they did it all in one backend language, this big monolithic thing. And this is a kind of familiar story now. This was on Rails. So we even have a word for this in the industry now, monorail. I think the Twitter people created this word. They had created a monorail. They had a synchronization protocol that they had created that didn't really work. It worked except for some edge cases, but when you're dealing with this level of concurrency, pretty much it's nonstop edge cases. So uh, they were doing a great job of TDD, but ultimately it took like 15 minutes to run the test suite. And anytime you would change something or the time zone would change or all sorts of problems would occur, the test suite would break all over the place. So it would look like this, it would take forever, you would end up getting frustrated. More, over time, there were more and more red broken hearts in the test suite. Um, this actually is what they look like, by the way, if you're using Ruby stuff, there's a plugin for RSpec that prints these beautiful emoji hearts. So you stop maintaining them over a while because you, you can't run them, it's terrible. And the test suite becomes worse than useless. And I remember on December 18th, I was in Washington, D.C. at the time, and I was on HipChat with them, because Slack didn't exist, so, you know, therefore I'm not uncool for saying HipChat. I was on HipChat with them. They launched, everything went down. Like the investors told me, if the new version still works within two seconds, you did better, because it really did go down as soon as they launched. And I remember helping them and saying, like, helping them and saying, well, have you tried putting some caching in? So that's what they spent the rest of that day doing. That allowed them to eventually, after about a week, be able to stay up. But guess what? The cache was invalid. So, you know, I'm sorry to them for that. But one of the first things I did when I joined was, of course, remove all the caching code, because usually that speeds up applications. I don't know if you've experienced that, too. Um, and then when I got there, it was about two months after they launched. They had a week of continuous downtime. And then they had two months of barely being up, where the uptime was going slowly up kind of every week. And eventually they got to where as long as they didn't touch anything, it would be OK. And if they touched something, then maybe it would fall apart. And really, like, I was supposed to be CTO of this company, but I was told by the CEO on the first morning, this is where you're going to sit. It's the room where the back end people are, and this is just all you're going to do. And that was the only thing that I knew. So just go in this room and see what you can make happen. And I walk into the room, and everyone just looks like, oh, God, what is going to happen? Um, so they were completely terrified. And being terrified is probably the worst thing that you can experience in a job, I guess, except for like being killed or something. But you know, uh, but they were completely terrified. So the thing that they were really afraid of is getting back into that period that they were in previously, where they were down nonstop. Because what they had done is the backend team had created something that wouldn't work. The client teams had actually created beautiful clients. They were so proud of them. Everyone had gone into this like crazy crunch mode to get it done. And the back end team had really failed everyone. Because no matter how good the client code is, uh, to some extent, it's not going to work if the back end isn't working. So they really had failed everyone. They felt ashamed. They felt terrified. They didn't want to go back to that where they were. So they thought, like, what's going to happen? This guy's going to come in. He's supposed to be a Ruby expert, so he's going to apply Ruby magic, and it's going to be great. And the first thing I did is I got the keys to the system, and they had a number of servers running, and I just started turning them off one at a time. And they're looking at me like, this is not what I expected. And then it crashed, of course. So on my first day, I crashed the system, completely unusable. And as a team, we spent a few hours trying to make it work again. And I'm sure they were thinking, well, this was a mistake. You know, th these Ruby people are crazy. Uh, I don't know why we hired this guy. But I made it better, because I came in the next day, and I did it again. And the beautiful thing about the next day is we had just spent the previous day fixing these problems. And so the next day, it took a little bit less time. And I did this every day for about two weeks. We crashed the system over and over and over again. Because really, it sucked anyway, right? What I wanted them to feel was, there's a fear that you have of touching this thing, of changing this thing. What you're afraid of is what might happen. So what I did is I put them into the situation that happened. No more fear. 
right? No more fear anymore. You're just, it's kind of like you're already being physically hurt. There's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> now, you know, it didn't just end there with crashing the system. That would be a fun story. You know, thank you. <laughs> We're done. Um, of course, we tried to clean this thing up. Now, they had created this monolith, and I said it's a to-do app, and you're probably thinking, well, that must be really simple. Of course not. Uh, programmers made it, so it's not simple at all. But also, it's, you know, nothing is really as simple as it sounds. All programmers look at a problem and oversimplify it and think, well, yeah, I can make that. That's easy. That's just a two-hour job. But they had encountered complexity, and they were doing pretty complicated things. You know, they were having to do sharing across different, like, sort of co different constellations of people, sharing different lists of stuff and getting notifications and trying to do that in an optimized way. And in the process, because it's Ruby, they were able to create all of this beautiful, magical coupling so that you couldn't really tell what was happening. It looked simple, but it wasn't. Logic was just buried in abstractions, and there's just no way to find out where anything is. And as I said, they had created their own environment of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This FUD word actually isn't as popular as when Microsoft was the bad guy, is it? It's interesting. But most of you are old enough to remember that. But, uh, so I'm talking about the FUD that you create for yourself. Anyway. This is just the beginning of the story, so I want to back up now a few years. Um, I've been talking about this thing for a while, and this is, from, this is the opening slide from a keynote that I gave a couple of times last year, but specifically at Scala Days, I think is when I put this up. Uh, I mentioned that I, I'm a software euthanizer. Back in 2006, the beginning of 2006, I wrote this series of articles that got on the front page of Dig, which was actually a big deal back then, called The Big Rewrite, and a lot of people have quoted it since. And it's about why doing big software rewrites is a bad idea. And what I was really doing was just blowing off steam, because already in 2006, I had spent what I thought was an entire career doing this system euthanization. Uh, euthanization? Euthi yeah, euthanization, that's good enough. Um, but I wanted to find a way to build a system that would exist. I'm tired of this, as I said. And so, as an ex-musician, I thought about this word. I was actually uh, in the car with Corey Haynes, by chance, um, getting lost on the way home from Boulder to Longmont, which if you're from Colorado, you know is not actually possible, but somehow we did it. And uh, I was talking about a, an upcoming talk that I had to do, and I think Corey came up with this idea. I don't know. I don't know how it happened, but we were talking about why is legacy a bad word in our industry? Because in the music industry, it's a good word, but in our industry, it means something like this. Like there are two definitions, an upshot, a consequence, aftermath, like really nasty kind of stuff. Legacy is not a word that most of you associate with something good. If I offer you a job and I say like the title is legacy software engineer, you're not very impressed. However, in music and art and literature and pretty much anything else you can think of, the word legacy has a positive uh, connotation. And it means that you're leaving behind something. So like heritage, endowment, bequeathment. You're leaving something for future generations. But somehow we've twisted it around in our industry. So like Beethoven left a leg legacy. He's still a bestseller. It's amazing. We don't do this in software, though. In fact, in software, uh, as we saw in this morning's keynote, this is a beautiful visualization of the Standish Chaos report that I made. Um, you don't see the absolute numbers because they don't matter. But this is showing you successful, challenged, and failed software projects. And I think we heard the definition this morning. The green ones are successful, so we all sort of know what that means, although I would bet that they weren't that successful. Yeah. Um, the challenged ones are significantly over time or over budget. So to me, that's not really successful. Um, that's pretty much a failure, too. And the failed ones actually never launched. So look how bad we are. And this goes through 2009, but it doesn't matter. It, it looks like this forever. And it, it probably will look like this forever. I don't know. I can probably do this talk for the rest of my life. <laughs> Ugh, that's depressing. But. Uh, <laughs> This is what it looks like. So we really, really suck. All of us, me and you, we really, really suck. We're really bad at delivering software projects. And then when we do, 
we deliver crap. Maybe it's really crap, maybe it's not, I don't know, but business software that's deployed the average life expectancy is five years. That is scientifically generated by me when I type these words into the slide. But it feels right to me, and it probably feels right enough to you. You build software, and then you hear after you leave that company that someone, there was some project to rewrite it and throw it away, and you think, of course, there was. And, and you think back to all the nights that you spent cramming to get it done by a deadline, and how much it sucked, and the sacrifices you made from your personal life. And it's really depressing. So you barely ever launch a successful project. When you do, it's dead after five years. And then people like Joel Spolsky say that it takes 10 years to make good software. So your software is dead in half that time. That's a bummer. What are you going to do? How do you create legacy software? How do you create a legacy in software? This is what I've been thinking about for quite a while now. Uh, very, very deeply. So I talked to my friend Mike Feathers. Mike Feathers wrote a book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And until recently, I think it was the only software book that I could find that had the word legacy in the title, because most people are smart enough to know you shouldn't write a book about software and put the word legacy in the title. But he did. And so I talked to him about it, and I asked him, like, how do you create legacy code? And he said, well, you know, tight coupling and not understanding business requirements and using fringe technologies. And I was like, dude, you're depressing me. I'm talking about, like, how do you create a legacy? And he said, oh, OK. Uh, maybe you should read this thing by Dick Gabriel. So Dick Gabriel, if you don't know him, he wrote a bunch of really influential stuff, including like Common Lisp Object System and a bunch of papers that are worth reading, like Worse is Better. But he wrote this thing um, called Design Beyond Human Abilities. And it's actually a, a presentation that he gave that he converted into a paper. And it's about creating software beyond what humans could do. So he's talking about like multi-trillion line software projects where probably all of us combined have created less than three billion lines of code already. But like, how would you create a multi-trillion line software project as a way of thinking differently about design? And one of the things he says here is that biological systems are very much larger than anything coherent that people have built. And he says a lot of really interesting things about biological systems. Like he talks about cellular regeneration. Cells go bad and the cells die and they get replaced. And we've heard all this all our lives, right? Like, I am not the same physical being that I was 10 years ago or when I was born. I'm much larger than I was when I was born, for example. Like, at least 50% larger than when I was born. That's, that's also scientific. Um, and actually, if, if, like, if I think about me, you should see what I've eaten today. I shouldn't be alive. <laughs> I don't maintain this system. Biological systems also have a thing called homeostasis. It's a thing, it's a process, whatever, that I'm not a science-y guy, but homeostasis, uh, to, to oversimplify it, is a way that a biological system can self-regulate. So one part of the system leans toward a certain type of behavior that would be bad for the system overall, but then another part of the system regulates that. And the cellular regeneration stuff is sort of part of that same idea. So what in a software system is a cell? Because it seems like in, in the system that's me, it's okay if my cells are replaced and somehow I can still keep giving this talk over and over again. I'm still me. I am the system. But what in software is a cell, and what in software is a system? And when do you build a system versus a cell? How do you know you're building the right one? This is what I started thinking a lot about. And if I could get it right, could I build a system that can outlive me? Without, of course, just prematurely ending my life. This is a dangerous career goal, I understand. So anyway, back to Back to the Wonderlist thing. Here I am, I'm, I'm spending long nights and weekends trying to keep this ailing system alive because my desire is to not kill any more systems. 
I mean, already for six years, I've desired not to kill another system. But then the day comes, we have a board meeting, and we say to the board, yes, we are going to have to kill this system. We're going to have to replace it. But this time, it's going to be right. And remember, this is the third time we're doing Wonderlist, and the fourth time we're doing a whole new system. And one of the board, board members, who is one of our investors, we're a VC-backed business, so he's a board member who really you know, holds a lot of power. You could hear, it was a call, and you could hear him, like, I don't know, spitting or something. I don't know. It sounded like he could hardly breathe. And then when he started speaking, he said these words, please tell me I'm never going to hear you say that you have to do this again. But you could just feel like, the hatred, and not the hatred for us, but the hatred for a situation. And, and I said, I promise that we will never rewrite the system again. And if you hear me saying that we're going to do it, you can fire me from this job, you can publicly ridicule me, and I will leave the software industry. And uh, that's it. Thank you. That's the end of my career. <laughs> But yeah, the system didn't survive. We had to kill it. So how, starting this process, how can I create a new system that can survive so that I'm not publicly ridiculed and I have to leave the industry? So I'm going to talk about some of the things that we did, um, starting with kind of like tenets, if you want to call it that. That's really fancy sounding, but really it's just like random ideas that I had collected over time that I thought sounded smart that we tried. And, uh, and then I'll talk about more concretely what we ended up with. But we created something kind of strange, I think. So here's the first one. Now, this list, uh, we're not really using Microsoft Visual Basic exclusively. No, we're not really using Microsoft Visual Basic. But the first rule that I decided to come up with was that the system should be heterogeneous by default. Not like it's OK to be heterogeneous, but like actively encouraging. We're going to write this thing in a bunch of different programming languages. And why did I do this? Well, one reason is I didn't want this weird coupling that happens when you have a language like Ruby, which, by the way, I love. I'm not bashing on. I've used it for many years. But um, you have a language like Ruby where you can just reach into the guts of anything and do anything you want. Like you can't find out, you can't, there are no boundaries in a situation like that. And that's really why I love Ruby, but I didn't want to build the system that way. So I wanted to create an environment where tight coupling, at least that type of tight coupling, would actually be so hard to do that you'd really have to go out of your way to do it. So like we have some JVM stuff, we have Haskell, we have Node, we have Rust now, we have Go, pretty much anything you can think of that you might want to try if you're some nerdy programmer, we probably have it running in our system. And I think that's OK. The other reason that I wanted to do this heterogeneous by default thing is really just I have a, a career full of standing at the water cooler or the coffee maker or whatever, listening to and participating in complaints about why I can't use this technology at work because my boss says I can't, or we're tied to some old crappy version of Java or Tomcat or Struts back then or whatever it was. And I want to do something new. And if I find a job where they let me do the new cool thing, I'm going to go do that. And so I wanted to create an environment where my people own the technology choices and can do literally anything they want. And that's what we have. The rule is, you, if you're on my team, you don't have to ask me for any programming language, anything you want to try. You can do it as long as it follows some rules. One of the rules is the code for a new thing, but primarily this is the rule, needs to be no larger than this. So you have to look at me for this one. It's this big. The code must be this big or smaller. And I always hold my fingers up. And I never really measure their code with my fingers, but it directionally it kind of sets the idea. I want code that's so small that anyone can come along and read the Haskell code, even if they're terrified of Haskell, which it seems everyone on my team is, except for me and the other guy who wrote the Haskell service. But anyone can understand it, because it's this small, and they're not stupid, and Haskell's not hard to read. Haskell is easy. Everyone should do it. You bunch of idiots, you do Haskell. 
Um, anyone could read it. And even if they can't get it to compile, then they can rewrite it if there's a problem. No big deal. Throw it away. Throw the code away. That's the other thing. This is the idea from cellular regeneration. When we first started building the system, I said, we know we're going to have to rewrite it. We know we're going to have to upgrade frameworks. It's going to be terrifying when we do. Even if we stick with Ruby, it's going to be hard, because Ruby is going to go to version 2, and we're going to be pressured to go to version 2 at some point. The libraries will start working, blah, blah, blah. So let's just get into a habit of throwing code away. And if it's this big, it doesn't matter. Just throw this little piece away. So it's really easy to upgrade. And it's really easy to think about new things and change, and whatever else. So this has been an active goal. And whenever someone talks about writing something that already exists and works OK in a new language, I say, excellent, let's try it. Worst case, they're going to spend an afternoon, have fun, decide it didn't work, run some tests, doesn't work, whatever, throw it away. Best case, it's better than the thing that we had before, and we throw the old thing away. Perfect. So the code should always be changing inside the system. And it pr starts to already force this idea that the system is a thing and the cells are a thing. And we also move from the monolithic database idea to a bunch of tiny databases. And this is actually a diagram of our database topology. It's very exactly created in Keynote, where you hold down command and you just start moving stuff around. Uh, but we really do have about that many databases right now. We used to have one. Just for a simple to-do app, we have this many databases. Um, and you might think this creates complexity, but it actually makes things a lot easier. Because we took what was a really big, hard problem for us, and we turned it into a bunch of tiny problems that are easy to solve. And my hope is that eventually we'll have millions of databases. Because I think every user could have a database, or every task in the system. I don't know. There's probably something we could do. And, uh, you know, hopefully it will never have to go through the Jepson tests, but it, it works pretty well so far. Um, so what we did is we have a bunch of small services too, and the tiny services sit on top of the tiny databases, just like uh, Dr. Parsons said yesterday, is common in a microservice architecture. Uh, the services own the databases. And this is a little snapshot from our configuration management system that we made in Bash where I'm just counting the number of service configurations we have, and there were 150-something of them for our simple little to-do app at one point in time. There are a few more now. And then we also kept the, the actual requests or the invocations of things tiny. And yes, we are using uh, crystal meth to do this uh, HTTP. <laughs> But uh, we have some ways that make this OK. One thing that makes this better than what we had previously and tolerable as a synchronous thing, man, it's really terrifying to be the last keynote and listen to the, the ranty keynote in the morning before you. And then they're sitting there looking at it. <laughs> but it works, I promise. The requests themselves, if they're tiny, it, yeah. No, I'm not even going to explain it. <laughs> you scare me too much. But no, we used to, so we used to have a system where we made these large requests, and we, would, we created this batch API that was the worst idea ever. But the plan was like, let's reduce the connection overhead from the mobile clients, because that's expensive. And we'll allow them to do a whole bunch of requests via a single HTTP request and get the whole batched response back. So it was this huge blocking thing that was synchronous that was terrible. And what we've done, in effect, we actually have an asynchronous layer on top of this, so you can stop judging me now and wait till later. But um, what we've done is tried to create tiny, tiny little requests. And yes, the clients actually make them. But in effect, you can do things asynchronously, and you, you don't have this big blocking thing going on. So again, take a hard, big problem and turn it into a bunch of tiny problems, and then solve them one at a time. And then to avoid the piles of abstraction thing, we, we have not favored reusable libraries at all. We've done it a couple of times, and we're actually refactoring them out into services. So does this hurt performance on the small? Sure. But it helps performance in the large, and it helps our ability to be uh, productive in the large. So we're creating more and more reusable services. And when we find ourselves building a library that we share among a bunch of different services or apps, we think, is there an opportunity and does it make sense to make this a service instead of a library that we mix in everywhere? 
Okay. So some more deployment-oriented stuff, but still in this kind of cellular regeneration uh, vein, all of the nodes that we deploy are disposable, which means you will never actually worry about the uptime. In fact, the only worry I have of uptime of a node is it's been up too long and I can't trust it. And a node is a server in this case. So we happen to be on AWS, which seems to have the most advanced set of features available for doing this kind of thing, but it would work on other cloud providers. We, for, for any new uh, deployment of our software, we generate new images. We don't do Docker yet, but we generate new images and we, uh, we clone them, deploy them out, and then destroy all the old ones. So we never upgrade software on existing nodes. So you don't have that thing where, like I remember in the 90s, I was a system administrator and I would do uptime on the Sunbox and it would be up for like two years. And I was amazed and proud and horrified because we'd changed so many things, there was just no way we could ever reproduce it. So over time, people built stuff like Chef so that you could let a system live for a long time but have a way supposedly to reproduce its state. But that doesn't really work. So in our world, we, we throw away the servers, and with that, we can throw away Chef, the complexity of Chef. This is one of the best things we did for ourselves. And it's not Chef's fault. It's the fault where Chef solved a problem that we don't have to solve anymore. At least in my limited perspective of the world, I don't ever want to have to solve this problem again. So we replaced Chef with, originally, uh, a make file, and because we're lame, we called it wake, which is wonder make, because everything has to start with wonder at our company. Um, it's no longer a make file, because that was a really stupid idea, but it's, it's bash scripts, which sounds even less, in, less intelligent, but I promise it works. Uh, in fact, the author of Ansible posted something yesterday saying, this immutable deployment thing, this is the way to go, and by the way, you should just make bash scripts for this. That was gratifying. So we created Wake. It's just a convention-driven set of bash scripts that allow us to provision these new instances and then roll them out. And what have, what have I run here? You can't see it because it's too big, but I'm running Wake info for our files service. And you can see uh, various things that we're running for the file attachment feature of Wonderlist at that time. And then here I run Wake describe ELB for iCal. And we can see servers running to support our iCal integration. And then I wake scale iCal to three servers. And it changes the number of servers from nine to three, I think it is there. And so we can do all this stuff, just usually there's one command, if you even need a command, to, you know, we're, we have too much load right now on a certain service, so we can scale it up from 20 to 30 and handle the load, that kind of thing. And then we, we built a simple little webhook thing, so GitHub for every, every one of our 150 plus repositories, when you merge something to master, it goes ahead and hits this thing that we call awake, of course, which starts building the images for us, and then we can scale with a slider and do replaces and all this stuff. So we built, with a very minimal investment, and a bunch of bash scripts and a crappy little Ruby Sinatra app, we built our own immutable infrastructure system. So getting into some of the details of what we created, um, we have this multi-tiered architecture, and probably this isn't going to be very obvious, especially where it says English and German, but I'll explain what this means. Basically, every Wonderlist client connects to a WebSocket service, which is the asynchronous thing I was telling you about. And then we have a, a proxy, because we have all these you know, hundreds of services behind a thing. You need to have at least one place where the clients can talk to. So we have a proxy that we built, which is really like a modified Nginx, and then we have two layers of REST services. And this I will talk a little bit about because I think it's uh, an interesting and useful part of the story. And then we write everything through the same, right now, reusable software library that's a write layer. And then for everything, we push every change that happens in the system into a message queue. And we actually push it into two message queues just in case. That's our... our uh, poor man's um, hacker way to deal with rabbit not working, for example, but it actually has been working. Um, 
And then Wonderlist I mentioned is a real-time synchronization service. And if you haven't tried it, it's free, so you can try it. I think you will be impressed if the internet works. Like you, you have your iPhone, you have your Mac, your Windows client, whatever, you, you share something with someone else, it immediately pops up. Like we want it to feel like a remote control. So although it's all REST driven and there's all this stuff going on with asynchronous stuff in the background, it happens pretty much instantly. And that happens because we have a standardized uh, message queue for processing every change that happens in the system. So we don't have to build that over and over and over again. There's just one convention. And this is what the network diagram looks like. So I mentioned we have this real-time layer. That's a thing we built in Scala with actors. So every, every client that connects actually gets a WebSocket, which has a running uh, actor, as in actor model in Akka, which represents that client's connection, which can then subscribe to the message queue. And then we did something sort of interesting here, and this is the synchronous versus asynchronous thing where hopefully I redeem myself a little bit. Although from the proxy all the way down through all the REST services to the databases, obviously it's just synchronous HTTP. The way that the clients make their requests is they wrap what would normally be an HTTP request in a very small JSON envelope and then they just spew them into the socket server as fast as they can. And each one has a request ID which is generated, which they can then pair up with a response on the way back. And then the socket server, because it's Akka Scala, is running in massive parallel in the, parallel in the background, hitting all of these synchronous services asynchronously, and then streaming the results back to the clients over the WebSocket. So though the, the chain and the things you have to think about are completely synchronous, from where it says smart proxy all the way down, which I think is great because for me, it's very hard to think about things asynchronously. We localize where we have to think about the asynchronous part to just that one bit. That's really just doing joins essentially. And then, so I mentioned we have an English layer and a German layer. And this is important enough to mention just because it, it tells you a bit about the benefits of an architecture like this. The English layer, as we call it, is the stuff right under the smart proxy. And smart is in quotes. I won't talk about why that is. So the reason it's called the English layer is all the services there are named for the English name of the thing that you would expect it to be managing. So in our system, we have lists, we have tasks, users, memberships, those sorts of things. That's the name of those services. None of those have any connection to a database. They handle authorization, some business logic, et cetera. And then they also handle talking to the German layer. You know, the German layer, it's the German names. So Aufgaben for tasks, Listen for lists, Einstellungen for settings. And now I'm just showing off that I've learned some German. Um, those things are actually sitting on top of the data sources directly. They are abstracting away the data source, which allows us to have MySQL, Postgres, DynamoDB, Redis, et cetera, et cetera, as data, data sources underneath these things without any, anyone else caring. Um, and they have super user access, essentially. So they're like little, they're basically like connecting to the database itself, but having a REST interface instead of a data, direct data, um, database interface, whatever that would be. And of course, the German one is the super user one, because Germans in our company can do anything, and the rest of us are stuck with the English thing. And then, as I said, any write to the system, W-R-I-T-E, write, goes through a common write layer which makes sure, and that's a software layer, and so all the writes actually still happen in Ruby, which is an unfortunate consequence of code sharing versus service sharing. They go through a, a write layer which ensures that they get written to the database, archived to another place, the mutations get sprayed out to this common system that routes them all to the right places, um, and that's what drives our real-time integrations, all sorts of other things. So we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so I, I wrote Rails recipes, as I know mentioned, and I did Rails for a long time, and I'm not going to apologize for it. But one of the things that, that I think Rails did for our industry, uh, certainly didn't invent it, but popularized at that time the notion of convention over configuration. And that's one of the, the like a huge step forward in the mid 2000s for every everyone doing web development at least. So this is a thing that has been ingrained in me. On the day that we decided that we were going to start this rewrite, the one of the other developers and I went to my house, 
and typed something like this. So we just decided all the services are gonna be the same. We put the service names in an array, and we literally typed at the bash prompt this command that had a shared template that just generated all the things exactly the same. So it was stupid, wrote, copy and paste, basically. But what it allowed us to do is though we have 150-ish services, we don't have the complexity of 150-ish services. We have really just one way we talk to things and they have different names. So it's quite easy to deal with. And one of the, other, one of the only places that we have left where we do code sharing is we built a library in Ruby at first because we prototyped everything in Ruby called API Client, which is a very generic name, which is just a stupid way of wrapping conventionally how you talk to REST services, which gives us a bunch of benefits of like performance monitoring and logging and stuff that you can bake in. And every time we add a new language, which I said, we, I think we have like 15 backend different languages now, each one of them now has an implementation of this thing if it's necessary. Like we can build it once for the JVM so we don't have to which means that when you want to talk to a service, you don't need to think about how you find it and what you call things and how the URLs look. It's all done for you. And that's part of the magic that makes this thing work. And it's just stupid, simple stuff, simple. Uh, of course, we had to build some sort of service resolution thing. And speaking of stupid, we initially started with a YAML file, just a text file that we would check into a repository and just copy it to every system as we deployed. That was sort of a pain in the ass, so we changed to JSON eventually. We eventually auto-generated the JSON. Now we're in console, which actually just auto-generates JSON on the server for us. But um, you'll need something like this if you go to one of these microservice architecture thingies. And then here's one of the benefits. So at the beginning of this, I was talking about, I was showing you the red lines and the database on fire. This is really where we were going, is thinking back to the days of the monolith, one of the biggest problems with a monolith is when there's something wrong with it, it's really hard to figure out what's wrong. Unless you're like a real expert and it's some language and runtime where you have tools to get into the, de the details of it and see what's happening, whereas Ruby, PHP, et cetera, are not good examples of that. In our system, it's very easy. It's very easy to see where hot spots are, where trouble is, because everything is so separate. As long as we measure everything. So, Going back many years, if you haven't read this, this is Etsy's post on measuring everything. They, they measure like how much coffee is in the coffee makers at the Etsy office, and it shows up on graphs so that they can get alerts if it's too low. Um, when I was at Living Social, we were measuring like business metrics, and we had a system for measuring aberrations, so you could throw any kind of business metric into this system, and we could tell if it was weird. So even if there wasn't an obvious problem with the system, you would get alerts when things were weird. And we've taken that idea uh, to heart here. And as just one example, this is um, a screenshot from Labrado, and this is just what Labrado looks like. So I know you shouldn't have black slides with colors on them, but um, I sort of tried to enhance it. One example, because we're going through AWS and everything's automatically fed into Labrado and we have 150-ish services, when there is a performance problem, there is literally one dashboard that we didn't even have to make that shows up in Labrado where you could mouse over the services and you see every single load balancer and what the performance characteristics of the request going through that load balancer are. And you just mouse over and if you're having any kind of issue, you mouse over it and you can see like, oh, it's tasks, but Aufgaben isn't messed up. And Aufgaben means tasks in German. So what does that tell us? There's something wrong at the tasks level that is not the Aufgaben service, and therefore probably not the tasks database that Aufgaben is wrapping, but rather it's something up there. Maybe we're just over capacity there, and we could go to awake and slide it up, and usually that actually solves the problem. And we've, of course, automated that stuff at this point. Also, now that we have all these things, we have all these separate services. Uh, normally I would have a slide here that says tests or testing is a design smell. Um, and I thought about putting it in today, but I didn't want to dwell on it too much. But we favor monitoring over testing. So monitoring is very, very much important and uh, an ingrained part of our, our process. Uh, one of the rules for any service we create 
is when you create the service, you have to actually put all the metrics in, generate the dashboard, and put it in the readme before you can launch it. So when you go to the, the code in GitHub for the service, you can link directly to the dashboard that has all the important stuff that the service is supposed to wrap. Um, that allows us to do canary in a coal mine style deployments, which means we can roll out just a few of a different version of a service and watch all of our metrics and see if there's a problem. So this is a, you know, a case where obviously performance was negatively impacted by uh, a deployment. And in fact, I think this was, I'm, I'm cheating here, this is a screenshot of one of my first days in the office when I was crashing the system. This is what it looked like. So it was okay, and then I did something, and it was terrible for hours after that. Doesn't it make you want to hire me, the way I talk about this? So how we migrated, we were in this big, massive thing, and of course, we were going to kill the big, massive thing, but we had the, the luxury to take a little bit of time to do it. So the first thing we did is we started removing all the joins from the database, because we had a massive database, and of course, we thought that we could do these big queries, and those would be more efficient than doing separate queries. Of course, that was wrong. Um, we removed all the joins, we separated the databases out so that we would have smaller problems to deal with, but we did it all in the old system. And I think this is an important part of any rewrite that you ever want to do. So if you have to do a rewrite, you need to spend a lot of time with the old system making it better. Even though the whole point is to get away from it, like there's no clean way to get away from it. You have to spend time in the old system. So we separated the databases. We started prototyping new features with ideas of the new approach that we had, of this whole thing of these mutations flowing through a message queue and going real time out to the clients. And we built really ugly, stupid, not very good versions of all that. And then uh, we replaced the database connections on our old system with calls to our new APIs. So this allowed us to actually run some of the new APIs when performance was a huge concern for us in production for months as we built the whole system. So we had a really strong level of confidence before we deployed, which was then uh, additionally bolstered by the creation of this project that we call Böse Gurken, which is sort of a play on the cucumber testing framework, but it means evil cucumbers. And uh, you can read about this of course, you're not going to memorize this, but the slides will be up. But if you Google for saving our bacon with evil cucumbers, it's probably the only hit that's going to be obviously about software. And you can see what we built. This is, again, an actor-based thing in Scala and Akka, where we simulate crazy users. And what we did is we took our Android sync library, which is in Java, wrapped it in Scala, built a thing that we could we could deploy with our same immutable infrastructure service, so we could deploy effectively millions of crazy users that were actually uh, talking to each other and sharing lists with each other and sharing tasks. And you can see, like it would say, roughly half the time create a list and then pretty often create a task. Um, they would share with each other, and then there would be points where they would stop and check to make sure that they were in sync with themselves and that lists that were shared were in sync with each other. In doing this, we found bugs in Amazon's underlying infrastructure, in RabbitMQ. We found all sorts of things. And really, right up until the launch of Wonderlist 3, I was horrified that this was the end of my career because we kept crashing things so, so badly. But it turns out it was just because we were doing really crazy stuff. So finally, we do the launch. And again, our people are super at marketing. And the launch was boring. There was actually, there were two moments of panic on the, on, on the launch day. One was it felt like nothing was happening, and we thought, well, does no one care about us anymore? But we looked at the metrics, and yes, they did. It brought us to a new level. The next was I saw a big spike on the graphs, and I went and looked, and it was our one Haskell service. It spiked from two to five milliseconds or something like that of response time. So that turned out to be OK in our world. Um, embarrassingly, it hovers at like 10 now. but. Haskell, 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 Haskell. Um, OK, so I told them I would never rewrite the system again. And of course, it wasn't exactly true. It just depends on how you define system. So this was August of last year that we launched Wonderlist 3. A lot of the system was in Ruby at that point. And what we've done since then is replaced, I think the number is now 80% of the back end with new code in different languages. So we now have 
Where Ruby used to be, we have Scala, Clojure, Rust, Go, more Haskell, Elixir, et cetera, Node in the back end. Um, and it wasn't just for fun. It was partially for fun, and that's okay. But it wasn't just for fun. We also have gone from like 30 servers for a specific service to three servers for the same service. And those three only because we want to run in three availability zones. But really, you could go to one, or you could, if you wanted to, you could pile them onto each other. And so it's amazing the money that we've saved uh, in the process and the ability to scale by rewriting and by regenerating and throwing away these cells, the system has not had downtime that had anything to do with these replacements, these upgrades, these rewrites. So I feel pretty proud about that. So where do we go in the future? Well, we didn't really make this thing happen. This homeostasis, self-regulating system, we're still working on that. Um, where, you know, like, the, the system is a network of things that depend on each other in different ways, and it has output signals you care about, some of which might be performance, some of it might be errors, who knows, there are different things. And you figure out how to let the system evolve itself internally, and like, this, this service is hurting this service, so kill it, that kind of thing. So we're working on this. Uh, we also had built a global um, asynchronous validation middleware so that every single JSON request in and out of the system, or JSON packet in and out of the system would be valid validated with JSON schema. Uh, I think this is actually a really important thing because some of the bugs that we have found that are probably inherent in this sort of microservices crazy heterogeneous architecture are because of just validating data. Um, so we're working on this. A big one is you can imagine to run a to, just a to-do list with 150 plus services and multiple availability zones, it's pretty expensive. Um, this was okay though. Like every investor, every, every person involved in this project said, do not worry about how much this costs, just make sure it's up, make sure it works. So we did this. And the goal was make it work, then make it fast, then make it cheap, and then probably somewhere in there make it pretty, but you know, certainly those three things. So we're on make it cheap right now. And we found sort of a silver bullet for that. So are any of you using AWS? Some are. Um, this is Hans Hasselberg. He's on my team. He wrote this post recently that you could also look up. Hans has figured out that we can run every single thing in our infrastructure on AWS spot instances. And a spot instance is, a way, it's, Amazon has this marketplace that's kind of like the stock market where you can bid on prices for servers of a certain type and when they're available for that price, they will be booted, however many you want it. And when they're no longer available, you'll get a message that's a warning and then they'll just shut them down. So it probably seems to some of you like a crazy idea to run your production infrastructure on this, but this is what we're gonna do. And we've actually got like half of our servers now are on these spot instances. And we're going, we're, our goal in the next month or so is that everything is spot instances, which means it could be killed at any moment it could be killed actually one minute from any moment or two minutes from any moment, which I find to be exhilarating because I'm the guy that crashes the system for fun. But no, because if we want to build a system where it's all about the system surviving but the cells not like necessarily not surviving, then running it on an infrastructure that's killing it for you, that's really exciting. And the savings are literally like 85 to 90% per instance. It's insane. I think, like, I think Pinterest is doing some stuff like this. When we do it and some others get wind of it, they're gonna have to change the model because it's not gonna work for them anymore, I'm pretty sure. But get it while it's hot. Um, Docker we're gonna do just because it's slow to make Amazon instances, that's not very exciting. I saw this post from CraftConf, from a CraftConf presentation a couple weeks ago from Francesco Cesarini, who's an Erlang person, of course. As we get more and more sophisticated microservice implementations, each one grows their own crappy version of Erlang. And I thought, yeah, we built a crappy version of Erlang. That's awesome. But it made me think, like, do you need microservices to do this? Like, what if I take all these same ideas and apply them to the clients? Because you may have noticed I've only been talking about our back end. How do I do that in the clients? How do I do it in an iOS app? 
I don't know exactly yet. That's my next focus. And then, of course, the next step is we refactor all this into a monolith. <laughs> but I'm not really joking about that. Um, I think there's something to be said for that, because microservices are more expensive. This SOA thing is more expensive in a, ver a variety of ways. Um, and I think this microservice architecture thing is just an example of service architecture done well. At least I think ours is done well, and people call ours a microservice architecture. So it's service architecture done well. And you know, back to the idea that like Erlang apps that are in one process, so to speak, could also benefit from the same things that microservices can, then maybe service architecture done well is just architecture done well. So I don't know. Maybe next year I'll be talking about refactoring to monoliths and you know, the big microservice disaster of 2015, but um, we'll see. Anyway, I think we have no time for questions. Am I right? I am right, because we have to go relax. But it has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, GoTo, for organizing. It's been a fabulous conference. And uh, I, am, I know what humbled means, and I am actually humbled to be here speaking to you. So thank you very much. <laughs>